Hi students, welcome back to geology. Today we are talking about metamorphism. So this is the first step in learning about our third rock type, which are metamorphic rocks. And we need to learn just how they're formed. So that is through metamorphism. First things first, I'm gonna show you the rock cycle again. So you've seen this quite a few times at this point, but we are now working on the metamorphic rocks, which are down there at the bottom of this diagram. The metamorphic rocks are coming from existing sedimentary rocks, igneous rocks, or further alteration of those metamorphic rocks that are already existing. And as long as you know how each rock type is made, you can easily create a rock cycle. It doesn't have to look like this. There's several versions I've showed you at this point. It can be simpler than this. It could be more complex than this. But basically what you want to remember is that any rock can aspire to be any other type of rock. And then we're not losing rocks. So we are not gaining or losing material here. It's just being cycled. All right, so metamorphism is driven by heat and pressure. So we need intense heat and we need intense pressure in order for anything to be changed or transformed. So metamorphic rocks, like I said, are transformed by metamorphism, by heat and pressure from existing metamorphic rocks, sedimentary rocks, and igneous rocks. This occurs between 10 and 50 kilometers at depth. And here, the reason that 50 kilometers is the cutoff is because at 50 kilometers, felsic minerals start to melt. So felsic minerals are those light colored minerals that are high in silica content. And the silica will actually have a much lower melting temperature than something like olivine. Olivine has high magnesium and iron, and it, has low in, it is low in silica. And so if you remember the Bowen's reaction series, that Y that I showed you where olivine was at the top and quartz was at the bottom, it's basically the opposite here from that melting. So olivine, or that crystallization. Olivine crystallizes first out of a magma or out of a lava, and quartz crystallizes last. Quartz is a felsic mineral high in silica content, and olivine is not. So if you flip that, when things start melting, quartz is going to be the first to melt and olivine would be the last in that example. Okay, so the, uh, the range that we're looking at here is 10 to 50 kilometers. Once something melts, it is no longer considered metamorphic. It is now considered igneous. So the melting is important because it starts to change to another, to another rock type. Okay, when we talk about the existing meta the rocks before they were metamorphic rocks or before they were this present metamorphic rock, we call those protoliths or parent rocks. So they tell us what type of rock this rock originally was prior to metamorphism. So proto means first and lith means rock. So protolith is the first rock or the original rock. Everything stays solid during metamorphism and the rocks do not melt, like I said, okay? All right, so we look at depth here. So we have the 10 to 50 kilometers. You can see that as you approach 50 kilometers, things start to melt. We're looking at igneous rocks there. But in this 10 to 50 kilometers range, that's where we're looking at metamorphism occurring. Above 10 kilometers, we're still just seeing sedimentary processes where things are being compacted and cemented together into sedimentary rocks. The most important agent in this process is heat. It's what is driving recrystallization. So that's recrystallizing and making bigger crystals more stable. And heat is dri that's driven here is generally going to be between 200 to 1000 degrees Celsius. So it starts around 200 degrees Celsius and it can go all the way up to 1000 degrees Celsius. Above 1000, that's where the melting starts to occur. So we start to see igneous formation. So some things that can create heat, obviously magma that's upwelling is really hot. So that magma is going to create some heat and then friction between rock bodies. So when plate tectonics is occurring, we've got plates that are pushing together, they're sliding past each other. All of that friction of those rocks interacting is causing heat. As you go down into the earth, we talked about this a little bit with the flux melting and the decompression melting with igneous rocks and with magma. When we go down into the earth, we have something called the geothermal gradient, which is temp the temperature that increases 
per kilometer. So it's about 30 degrees Celsius in a given area. But like I said, remember that geothermal gradient will shift depending on if you're next to a magma source or a divergent plate boundary or a subduction zone, things start to shift. With pressure, this also increases with depth. So both pressure and temperature are going to increase with increasing depth into the earth. And the pressure can be applied either from all sides, so equally, or it can be applied differentially from two sides. If we have all, all directions being applied, the pressure is applied from every side of the rock. We call it confining pressure, or sometimes it's referred to as lithostatic pressure. There's lots of terms here, so I try to list them all for you. And then if we have pressure from just two sides, that's what we call directed or differential pressure. So the pressure is not the same on all sides. It's from two specific sides. So with the confining pressure, like I said, you've got a, at the top there the, of that diagram, you have a, a rock with layers. And as confining pressure, pressure from all sides is being applied, the material just gets smaller and smaller and more compact. And so the pore spaces between grains and things start to get a lot smaller. But there's really no deformation of the material because it just got smaller. With directed or differential pressure, you have pressure from just two sides. And with pressure from just two sides of the rock, you end up with some really interesting fabric in the rock, which include things like folds and foliation. So we've talked about folds before with crustal deformation, where you just see these big folds in the rock layers, which you can kind of see there once the strata is deformed. But when we're looking at foliation, that's where minerals are aligning themselves perpendicular to that stress and parallel to each other. And so foliation is a result of this directed pressure within the mineralogy where the rocks are the crystals in the rock are aligning parallel to each other and perpendicular to that line of stress. So you can see before metamorphism, this is a granite on the left there. And that granite has interlocking crystals and they're kind of scattered. They don't necessarily have any sort of alignment to them. But after metamorphism and stress has been applied in a directed manner from just two sides, you start to see those minerals align and in the rock you can see there in that nice, that is a nice rock, G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, not like N-I-C-E. <laughs> the nice there, it looks like an organized granite, which it kind of is. It's a foliated granite, which makes it a metamorphic rock at that point. Um, but that those foliated texture that you see is only going to be found in metamorphic rocks because it's from the directed pressure that might be applied. Now with particular minerals, we can further define their foliation in which they create something called lineation. And hornblende is one of those minerals and hornblende is long in one direction. So it makes it a you know, tabular form. So if you look at the top image there, there is a bunch of horn blends in those rocks in the diagram, both in the picture. And you can see how they're kind of scattered throughout. They're not lineated, but after directed pressure, you'll start to see them line themselves up perpendicular to that stress. And if you were to slice open the rock that contains the horn blend, you could see them coming in and out of that rock. So it kind of shows you what that would look like and then uses straws. And as an example, um, the straws would be the horn blend aligning themselves into that foliation or lineation. And it's just a, another description of foliation in a linear fashion, which is why they call it lineation. All right, so with some metamorphic rocks, we will see foliation, but it will be so small and in grains, so not necessarily crystals. Slate is an example of that. It is a low-grade metamorphic mud, and the foliation is 
kind of hard to see except with the breaking pattern there. So all those kind of steps that you see is what we call slaty cleavage, which is a breaking plane along the slate, which allows it to break off into these slabs, essentially. And those slabs are showing you that it has foliation. If you look really, really closely to the cross section of a slate, you can sometimes see lines in the slate, which are the lines of the grains aligning themselves parallel to each other, but perpendicular to that stress. So look at these samples. I'll have you pause the video in a second. Try to see if you can tell whether they have foliation or they don't have foliation. Because when you go to identify metamorphic rocks, you're going to need to figure out if they have foliation or if they don't. So that's going to be your first step. Okay, so pause the video, see if you can figure it out. All right, so for number 35 there at the bottom left, does it have foliation or not foliation? That one has foliation. So you can see the black and white banding in it, and you can see the alteration of the minerals aligned parallel to each other. All right, and then in 39, that one's a lot harder because the grains are so small. But the telltale sign is kind of the stacking look that you see on the side of that rock. So 39 is foliated. 42 is non-foliated. All we have are interlocking crystals there. 38, you can see the layers of the crystals aligned. So 38 would be foliated. 44, you don't really see anything layered. It just kind of looks like a black chunk. 44 is non-foliated. 41 looks like a bunch of interlocking crystals again. So here, 41 is also non-foliated. So where do these metamorphic rocks come from? They come from a couple of different ways. So we have what we call metamorphic settings. And these are places where metamorphic rocks form. So the biggest most common is just burials. So things are just buried deeper and deeper and deeper. And eventually, maybe one of these other things also contributes. But essentially, if nothing is buried, metamorphism isn't occurring. So we need metamorphism to occur in, or burial to occur in order for metamorphism to occur. We also have things like contact metamorphism, hydrothermal metamorphism, regional metamorphism, fault metamorphism, and shock metamorphism. Okay, so I'm going to go through all of these individually. There are some definitions here that you can refer back to um, and a, di a couple diagrams here, um, but we're going to go through each of them individually. Okay, so with burial metamorphism, this occurs a lot of the time after sedimentation has occurred. So we have buried um, sedimentary rocks and then they get buried even further. And as they get buried, we start to see some alteration of those rocks. And so this can cause things like quartz sandstone, which is a sedimentary rock, to metamorphose into something like quartzite. Okay, and then contact metamorphism is where we have an intruding magma body. So we have some sort of pluton magma chamber rising to the surface. And as that happens, it heats up existing rock. As it heats up that existing rock, it also metamorphoses, metamorph, metamorphoses, metamorphisms, metamorphoses. Wow. Metamorphoses. Wow. Okay. We got it. Metamorphoses the rock that is already there. So that's that purple that it's kind of outlining in those diagrams. So this is only going to happen to anything that comes in direct contact with the magma. Anything that does, that's, you know, in the vicinity isn't necessarily going to metamorphose. You need stuff that is in direct contact. Okay, and so this can take something that is originally a sedimentary rock and metamorphose it into a metamorphic rock just by being in contact with a magma chamber. So that's why it's called contact metamorphism. All right, hydrothermal metamorphism occurs at divergent plate boundaries. Two plates are pulling apart here and magma is upwelling from the mantle. When that occurs, that magma coming in contact with the water 
is heating up the water. And as that water is heated, it starts to change the material that is already there. So whatever ocean basin material rock is there. So a lot of times it's basalt because it's coming from the magma. And that basalt will actually, what we call serpentinize and produce something called serpentinite. Serpentinite is a metamorphic rock that is formed from hydrothermal metamorphism of basalt. We find this a lot in California um, because there used to be a divergent plate boundary off the coast of the Pacific Ocean, um, Pacific Coast, and it actually got thrust onto the continent of North America during subduction of what we call the Farallon Plate which no longer exists because it's been fully subducted beneath North America. So um, again, this is at a mid-ocean ridge or a divergent plate boundary where water is heated by upwelling magma. All right, with regional metamorphism, we have a couple of examples here that I will discuss. The first one being continental continental collision. So when two continents collide, there's a lot of friction, a lot of pressure being pushed against each other and this material ends up being major folds and there's a lot of pressure here. So here we're looking at a high pressure situation but less heat. There is still some heat obviously but most of what the driving force here in this continental continental collision metamorphism is going to be from pressure. The other type is continental oceanic conversion plate boundaries. And the metamorphism that happens here at a subduction zone can be three different types. So we can see a high pressure situation, but low temperature. We can see a high temperature, low pressure, and we can see high pressure, high temperature. So what's unique here is the high pressure, high temperature zone where we see very high grade metamorphic rocks that have had significant change over the course of their history. Um, with the high pressure, low temperature, we're near a trench. So if you look at that diagram at the top, close to the trench where the two plates are actually meeting, that's where we're going to have a lot of pressure. So it's similar to the continental, continental collision, low temperature situation. The high temperature, low pressure is basically a contact metamorphism occurrence. It's part of regional technically. Um, and that's where that rising magma is coming up in um, the lower or shallow crust. And then we would see high pressure, high temperature zones, which would be deeper in the crust where the plates are colliding and magma is upwelling. Here's another look at that, showing you where those zones are. The lower temperature, high pressure metamorphism is occurring near the trench. The high temperature, low pressure is occurring near the surface where magma is upwelling. And then the high temperature, high pressure is occurring where the plates are colliding, you're deeper in the crust, and you have magma upwelling. All right, then we have fault metamorphism, which is usually happening near the surface. Um, rocks are involved in repeated brittle faulting and material kind of gets broken up in the center of this and it starts to just move and really grind things between the two rocks that are faulting or that are moving. And so this can create some really interesting rocks like a fault breccia or a myelinite. And so the diagram shows you what a myelinite might look like. They're very linear looking. And then this image is a fault breccia um, where all of that material just kind of got ground up between where the fault was moving. And sometimes we see shock metamorphism, which is the result of very high pressures and What's happening here is you see this kind of deformation or shock uh, lamination, and you can see kind of those lines in this mineral. And this occurs from really almost instantaneous, you know, results of very high pressure. So um, a lot of times this occurs when we have a, an impact, so some sort of space body whether it's an asteroid or a um, meteorite is impacting rocks on the surface and it can shock from the pressure that's applied. 
things like quartz, which is what this is an example of, this picture. Um, and it gives kind of this really interesting deformation in the rock. When we are looking at metamorphic rocks, we are looking for particular minerals, and those particular minerals tell us something about the pressure and temperature conditions in which they form. And those minerals can range from low grade to high grade, and they are found in, there are some minerals that are found specifically only in metamorphic rocks. So a couple of those being things like chlorite, garnet, sulmonite, if you have some of these crystals in your metamorphic rock, then you would know approximately what grade you're looking at or what pressure temperature condition in which they formed. And so we can get even more in depth with that, looking at the grades and the facies. And so depending on the pressure depth and temperature, you could either go from a low grade metamorphic rock to a high grade. It's obviously the higher temperature, higher pressure, deeper buried rocks are gonna be your high grade and then your lower pressure, lower temperature, and your shallow are gonna be your low grade. From there, we can then put in facies, so those are the grades, and then the facies are showing you a set of mineral assemblages in a particular metamorphic rock that we know form under very particular pressure and temperature conditions. And so we know, for example, that an eclogite is going to form between 400 and 600 degrees Celsius, at a depth of at least 35 kilometers, which would be a pressure equivalent to 10 kilobars. And so we know that if we're looking at an eclogite, we know that we're looking at regional metamorphism wherever this formed. It would not be something like contact metamorphism because the pressure and temperature conditions are just too great for just contact metamorphism or shock metamorphism, right? So it can tell us looking at what kind of mineral we have what the pressure temperature conditions were, and that can tell us what type of tectonic setting was present at the time of the formation of the metamorphic rock. All right, and then lastly, we have something called the Barovian sequence, which shows us the progression of index minerals through um, the depth of the crust. So as you move from the closest to the surface, we go through, so these are all foliated metamorphic rocks, we go through slate, then phyllite, then schist, and then gneiss. So gneiss would be our highest altered foliated metamorphic rock, and slate would be our lowest grade foliated metamorphic rock. All right, so like I said, metamorphic rocks are formed from altered sedimentary, igneous, or further alteration of metamorphic rocks. Heat and pressure is creating these metamorphic rocks. They occur between 10 and 50 kilometers, and some rocks display foliation and some do not. And the settings that we talked about were burial, hydrothermal, contact, and regional. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.